Is it 2018 already? Postdoc, the New Orleans ACS meeting is coming up. I need data. Again. Um, yeah, I got I got a little bit of data uh, to present, but, you know, I, I really need some new equipment. New equipment. Hmm. Well, time to make it rain. Damn. Nice, nice. This is awesome. You have no excuses now. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Hello, everyone. Couldn't find the Zoom controls there for a second. <laughs> it's like How's I've it? never done this before, you know? <laughs> How's everybody doing? Um, we're just getting things started, so I know there's a few of you logging in right now. But uh, if you're listening, please let us know in the chat if you can hear us. We always want to do a sound check, audio check. Um, so for those of you here, welcome to another Pine Research live stream where we uh, answer uh, basically an ask us anything live stream where you can ask us anything about electrochemistry. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we anticipate that this live stream will be approximately two hours long. We are using Zoom as a uh, an encoder. Basically, it's the platform that we're broadcasting from. So we've observed about a 20 second delay between when we say something and when we see something in chat. So if you type something in the chat and you don't hear from us immediately, don't be alarmed. Just be mindful that there might be this 20 second delay. If you are watching this after the live stream, which I know many of you do, um, we should have uh, timestamps in the description if you want to know, like if you missed a specific question uh, and you, you're trying to find it, maybe a few days after the live stream is aired, you'll be able to see the questions in the description below. Let's see. Um, also, a lot of uh, just always to tell people that usually electrochemistry is very difficult and it's just very challenging. So you can really ask us any questions you have. Uh, we're not going to make fun of you. We're not going to think that it's silly. It's a safe space for you to ask any and all electrochemistry questions that you have. And this is the Kind of platform or avenue to best answer them. Normally, when you ask us questions via email or just through typing in the comment section of YouTube or on our webinars, sometimes we can't give as full uh, an answer as usual, which is why we have these live streams. So we can use more, we can take more time and uh, use more tools to to answer some of your questions. You are, however, allowed to make fun of us for how terrible we are at drawing. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. <laughs> very that is. Bad at that is Part of it, I'm very, very bad at art. So every cyclical tamogram I draw looks like um, looks like it was created by the worst electrochemist that has ever existed. <laughs> no, no, you're it's it's good. It's also just like some of the drawing platforms. Yeah, and I, using a mouse. Yeah, like we have we have a mouse. I don't have you know they they make those like drawing things right like like the oh, yeah, the, the pen with the tablets. Yeah, yeah. And our colleague has one, and Wacom tablet. Yeah, that's Wacom. It. That's Wacom. Yeah, tablet. Wacom. I tried. Playing with it, I'm totally derailing the intro here. I don't care. No, no, it's fine. I tried playing with it, and it's like it's harder than a mouse, and I'm bad at a mouse. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this should be great. I can draw, you know, or I can write like chemical equations, and I I can't figure out like where it is. You know what I mean? It's like where the mouse is right. on the tablet shows up on the screen, and I feel like I'm looking in two different places at once, and I can't figure it out. I'm just not. This yeah. is not my jam. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> So um, again, this is going to be about two hours long. We're going to just apologize ahead of time for um, if, you miss, if we mispronounce your name when uh, asking questions. So um, we, uh, we usually put a reminder 
uh, YouTube video ahead, and we actually got a question from that. So we're going to start off by answering this question from Adarsh. I think, Adarsh, if you're on, please let us know. Um, or if you're watching this a little bit later, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But uh, Adarsh asks, what care should I take if I use a platinum wire as the reference electrode in a non-aqueous solution with low electrolyte concentration where I cannot use a normal silver silver chloride reference electrode? And Adarsh has a follow-up question after that, but let's first talk a little bit about reference electrodes and what care to take when using uh, reference electrodes. So let me see what's the best way to Zoom's describe right here. it. I've got PowerPoint up too, if you need. Yeah, I'm just thinking. So I guess generally speaking, let's do um, share. Where's you know, share screen and PowerPoint. Is... Wait, hit show all windows. I had it here, I think. There it oh, is. Here we go. Okay. Give us a second. I was out. Uh, also, for those of you who uh, who watch us uh, and you were at the ECS meeting last week in Boston, thank you for stopping by the Pine Research booth. Most appreciated. And we really like it. Um, and I'm going to go annotate. So a couple quick things about reference electrodes. <clears throat> reference electrodes generally have several properties that are very important to learn and understand. So the reference electrode potential is based on the Nernst equation for, for some kind of redox species. Like that's one of the main things. So if you're always curious about, well, what's the potential of my reference electrode? It's based on the Nernst equation and it's based on a, a, a redox reaction. That redox reaction needs to have fast electron transfer kinetics. That means that it, well, as the name implies, it just means the electron transfer process for that reaction needs to be fast that, you know, so that the potential isn't really like changing sort of say. So it needs to have fast electron transfer kinetics. And then reference electrodes are typically classified as um, ideal non-polarizable electrodes. So that is that is to say that if I had <clears throat> if I had a let's see what's the best way if this is voltage and this is current an ideal non-polarizable electrode would be something like a straight line that goes straight down and then maybe it goes this way and then the other side goes that way. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe it's the switched. Other way maybe the other way I around. Can't remember it too. Yeah. I never remember. Yeah, but yeah. but the basic idea is that regardless of how much current passes through the electrode, it doesn't. The potential basically remains the same. That's the key with when they say when they say ideal non-polarizable electrodes. And ideal polarizable electrodes are the opposite. It's more of a a horizontal line rather than a vertical line. Which if just to, if you look yeah. at the butler volmer equation on a kinetic response of a typical system, that's polarizable kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. that would be that what Alex just drew turned 90 degrees, right? Turn 90 degrees. Basically. That's right. Yeah. So when it comes to now, most people don't actually use a platinum wire as a reference electrode, um, mostly due to its polarizability in some regard, but you could use a platinum wire as a reference electrode, if you were able to have a redox reaction here with, that has fast electron transfer kinetics. So usually the only, the only reference electrode that uses a platinum wire is the standard hydrogen electrode. That's the system where you have say, I don't remember exactly, H, 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 like two H plus plus, Two electrons. Two electrons in equilibrium with uh, H2 gas. Yeah. Gas. All right. So that is a reaction that occurs on a platinum electrode. Getting used to this, this keyboard. Yeah, this keyboard's this a little wonky. Huh? Keyboard's a little wonky. But that all happens on a platinum electrode. So you can do this 
kind of experiment, you can use this type of reference electrode um, with a non-aqueous system. But it's got to fulfill all these all these things. It needs to. Um, it, it uh, this this looks like I did something, but it has to have these kind of three things. It needs to be a reaction based on the Nernst equation, so that's one. Um, and then it has to have fast electron transfer kinetics, so that's this is very fast on platinum, and it's usually an ideal non-polarizable electrode, so passing current doesn't change the potential. So if we go back to, uh, I want to stop screen share. Oops. Oh yeah, where is it? Yeah, move the I got to move this antique yeah, yeah. bar. So let me go back to Adasha's question about um, why I can't use a normal silver silver chloride reference electrode. Uh, you actually can in in something like a C the nitrile. It, it usually has to do with uh, the polarity of the solvents in some mm -hmm. cases. But you know, if you have a low electrolyte concentration, um, that may be kind of problematic just in doing electrochemistry experiments. Um, but uh, <clears throat> it's not very common to use a platinum uh, electrode as a working electrode for a non-aqueous system. Some people use internal standards like ferrocene with a silver wire, or they use a silver, silver oxide, um, or use nitrate, for example, as the electrolyte for the reference electrode. So... Um, those are just some some general comments. I think I would need to know a little bit more, but just keep in mind those three things when it comes to your maintenance of a reference electrode. Yeah, and when you're testing, for example, to see if the reference electrode you've selected, especially in a non-aqueous system, is working or it's appropriate, you know, you're you're looking to see if, for example, I have a peak because I have some redox process I'm studying. Okay, well, is that peak, as I scan back and forth five times, 10 times, 15 times, is that peak showing up in the same location each time or is it moving, right? Because if, because it's gonna, it's the, the, the feature, the location of features on your X axis, right? During like a cyclic voltammogram mm -hmm. are going to be dependent on the reference, the potential. So if you, if you're, um, if your reference electrode, whatever it is, is ideal, non-polarizable, and all of those things that Alex just mentioned, then probably the features you see will be relatively consistent from scan to scan. But if any of those are not true, you'll see your oxidation or reduction peaks start to move left or right with progressive scans. Yeah. And that indicates drift, which is you know not a good thing, right? You don't wanna <laughs> have that happen because then you don't know where it's happening, right? I mean. If you're just trying to measure current or peak height or something like that, okay, maybe you can get away with it. But right, most of the time you're trying to learn something about your system, trying to determine, you know, onset potential, over potential, something like that. You need to know where the peaks are occurring. And so if they're moving around, that's not, that's not good. So um, that's kind of a practical way for you to check that um, property of, you know, non-polarizable or what have you, right, with what you're using. Um, Adarsh had a second question here that said, in a typical cyclic voltammogram, for example, oxidation of ferrocene, why is it that during the reverse scan, the reduction current onset is not the same as the oxidation onset? So that is actually related again to the Nernst equation. Let me um, mm -hmm. let me kind of first of all just share. No, that is this window here. So I've done this really cool thing. There's a website. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's called google.com. <laughs> I'm kidding here, of course. But but so look at the Nernst equation, right? So here's the Nernst equation. Um the it in a okay, let me try to back up here. The electrochemistry that you're describing of a ferrocene um, process, let's just say, right? Uh, let me draw for you quickly, right? So you've, the point that you're saying is I'm scanning and I have, again, I'm so bad at art. You, <laughs> you have an oxidation peak. And then when you go back, your reduction peak, see when I focus, it's better. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, last week. Very good. That is actually pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty I, good. I, I could draw a duck, but I'll keep it serious. And the so peaks are separated. They're separate. On, on top of each other. It's exactly. All right. So here's here's my reduction peak if I'm doing UPAC yeah. conventions. And here's my oxidation peak, right? And so basically the question is, there's this split here. Why? Right? And the answer is nerdst. Okay. So <laughs> um, to some extent, the answer is a very unsatisfying one when I say something like, it's just the chemistry. It's the it's the thermodynamics or the the kinetics really is probably more or, or what it's 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 the I don't know what you'd say like it's just the fundamentals the phenomena as described by the Nernst equation. Like the Nernst equation is the equation that describes mathematic uh, um, quant quantitatively how much they're split or or what have you and like a reversible one electron or n electron process. Mm -hmm. But why it happens is more like phenomena like. I mean, well, what's the reason the, the, for that? The reason, the reason why, so um, there's a couple of things. So let's, if we imagine, let's say we had ferrocene that was attached to the surface. Let's say you had like a monolayer of ferrocene on an electrode. If you were to do cyclic voltammetry of a surface bound ferrocene molecule, you would get peaks that are on top of each other. There would basically be no onset potential, right? Like they would just be like, the oxidation and the reduction peak would be right on top of each other. Yeah, when you... The, yeah, that's right. So it'd be something a little bit like that. And <laughs> that's a complicated. <laughs> if you do a pulse method, you'll get that. Yeah, yeah. If you do a pulse method, like you would get you clarify something like that, that kind of a thing. But that's um, probably a bit more complicated. But the, uh, but it's really a lot. Like it's the shape of a cyclic voltammogram, like ferrocene, is diffusion controlled. It's the fact that you're not going to get a maximum peak current instant like immediately um you know that peak current is based on the mass transport of molecules ferrocene molecules diffusing towards the electrode surface and there's a time associated with it so even though thermodynamically you reach a potential where like oh all the ferrocinium should turn into ferrocene and all the ferrocene should turn into ferrocinium well the molecules just can't get there quickly enough and so that's why there's this onset this delay this lag sort of say and the Nernst equation assumes very fast electron transfer kinetics, like you know all this kind of stuff. So, um, so this, so the 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 distance between the two peaks in that sense is is dependent on diffusion kinetics. Uh, if you were to look at say the heterogeneous rate constant of that molecule, like if you didn't have ferrocene, you had some other molecule, if it had slow electron transfer kinetics the the separation between the anodic and cathodic wave would be bigger. If you had a lot of uncompensated solution resistance, the separation would be bigger. There's a bunch of other things like that that can affect the why those peaks don't line up exactly. But but that's generally speaking, yeah. it's a diffusion related process. Yeah. And and, and really to, to even expand on that more, it's an interplay between kinetics and diffusion, which is a is another discussion. I, I talked about this in uh, shameless plug here. One of my recent webinars on um, RRDE and RDE, Levitch, Kateki Levitch, all this kind of stuff. Um, I actually went into this in a little more um, detail and it's on our um, webinars playlist for tier two members of our YouTube channel. So yeah, you're welcome to join and take a look at it. But <laughs> um, it's effectively the short answer to that, which it's it, of why you even get a peak in the first place is because it's an interplay between kinetics and diffusion. So kinetics is governed largely by the Butler-Volmer equation, which looks something like this, where in all of exactly how this looks varies, but you have this exponential increase or decrease depending if it's an oxidation or a reduction, right? You have an exponential increase of current related to your um, reaction of interest. And the Cottrell equation, which is related to the diffusion, which is what Alex was just talking about. Yeah. And so basically you have this interplay when you're doing a cyclic voltammogram that the peak only shows up because at some point diffusion takes over. Basically, mm -hmm. if there was no diffusion problem whatsoever, if all of your molecules are surface bound or readily available perfectly and could always get there without any problem, you just have the current go up forever. But it doesn't. Eventually at some point, diffusion starts limiting how much stuff can react or whatever and you have the Cottrell equation will start to take over and these don't have to necessarily be at the same 
uh, yeah. le- level. In fact, they probably shouldn't be at. That's, <laughs> that's not a good drawing, but take it for what it's worth. So basically the peak happens because you have this interplay between the two. At some point, kinetics gives way to diffusion. You have a peak. And so that's going to happen in both directions. And when you, when these, equi- when, you know, the delay because of diffusion taking over causes the, the peak to show up at different places. And then the reason why it is where it is and that this value in a perfect system is technically 59 millivolts per N or something like that, right? It, it's because of the nurse equation we just, I uh, just showed you on the other one. There's, there was this RT over N F natural log of Q, okay? This is the reaction quotient. This is the ideal gas constant. This is the temperature, number of electrons and Faraday's constant. And so basically the reason for the peak split number wise comes from just plugging in numbers here. R is 8.3 at 298 K Faraday's constants, 96, 485. That's supposed to be numbers. (laughs) You're not using the, uh, I'm not using the two. I know I always forget. It looks like a Q. That's supposed to be a nine. That's a nine. Yes. Um, and then you have natural log of Q. We usually put it in, um, log base 10. So basically you end up with this like one over log base 10 of E, you, you end up with like a factor of 2.3 here. Basically, when you, when you plug these into your calculator, you get 59 millivolts. Yeah. That's, that's literally where it comes from. So per electron, <laughs> basically the ideal, you know, for like a perfect reversible one electron process, you would ideally get 59, you know, basically 60 millivolts of difference between where those peaks show up. That's that's exactly the numerical. That's where this comes from. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that kind of clears up that. And then, like I said, two pulse techniques are a way for you to sub- cyclic voltammetry is just sweeping up and sweeping back. And so this diffusion and these um, kinetics effects play a big role. Um, I just wanted to mention that when you do pulse techniques, you, you know, there's a bunch of different kinds, but basically you're pulsing up and then down and then up and down. There's <laughs> There's square wave, there's normal pulse, whatever. But what you're doing is you're taking away diffusional or like capacitive effects. And so when you do pulse techniques, you can actually get these peaks to overlay on one another because you can, it's like a subtractive thing. You're like, you can subtract um, some of these diffusional effects like from the process. And so sometimes uh, a process like a differential pulse voltammetry, I tend to recommend to people DPV, if your potential stat can do that, that is a way for you to clarify the peak position going either direction. And that'll give you a decent estimate of your E0. Mm-hmm. Like for ferrocene or whatever you're trying to find, I recommend DPV over something like cyclic voltage. Because in CV, you're just, you're, you know, you have to take the average of the two peaks. And if the split isn't exactly 59, well, why? And you, know, you sort of get these open questions and there's a lot of different reasons, pseudo reversibility or is it the reference electrode? You can see it gets complicated pretty quickly. So yeah. um, in any case, Pulse techniques are pretty useful in that regard. And then I'm going to shut up. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Yes. Okay. So we got a couple, hopefully that answers yep. Dasha's questions. If he's, if he's watching, he can, mm-hmm. he can ask for more. We have a couple more questions. Um, one of them is from um, a Chinese name. If you can write the, the pinging down, then we can pronounce it uh, on the, uh, on, on stream if you want. But the question is, how can I use CV to activate my cell catalyst? So, um, so we don't know enough, where's the curse? There we go. We don't actually know enough about, uh, the cell or what your catalyst is. Generally speaking, people will say, quote, activate the electrode, um, or activate their catalyst by sweeping the potential back and forth numerous times. So if we, uh, if we share, if I share screen again. The idea being that if you, let's say when you have your catalyst um, and you have like a cyclic voltammogram, sometimes there's just stuff on your electrode. There's stuff in your catalyst. There's, it's not a system that's at equilibrium or it has things that are blocking, say, active sites on your catalyst. And so what people will do is they may, I'm just going to make up a voltammogram, but maybe you get something that looks kind of, kind of like this. I'm not even so sure. 
But if you keep sweeping multiple times, you'll start to notice like, oh, I'm getting a little bit more current here. And like, oh, I'm getting a little bit more current here. And with each passing sweep, um, you know, you get a little bit more current each time. Um, and you keep doing this until the voltammograms start to overlap. Um, so that's my at least initial interpretation of, it's just, just gonna draw over this. <laughs> Infinite time. You should do more. You should do more. Yes. Clean, uh, clean the electrode very, very well. Yes. Yeah. Li literally, it's it's like you could be doing this like 50 cycles. You know what this looks like? What Have you ever like? been hiking? This looks like a topographical map. Oh, yeah. You know, where, where they show like. Yeah, like, that's it, right. If, you're, if you've ever gone hiking here, and I'm again torpedoing this whole thing. Yeah. Well, let's what, keep, keep talking while I do this. Whole yeah. 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 Clean, clean the surface. More. The surface I, more. Yeah. When you go hike, like if you hike a mountain, they'll, they'll be the maps where there's like concentric circles or like lines and it's elevation, right? It's just showing so, elevation. <laughs> anyway, I used to hike a lot when I was younger and had more time. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, I used, it's bringing me back. I, I like, uh, I like hiking. So, uh, anyway, but <laughs> the topographical CV, the topographical CV. That's right. But, um, but yeah, like, and you may choose to sweep the potential, um, fairly where is i'm just looking for the cursor okay so sometimes you may decide depending on the catalyst you may pick a fairly large potential range elevation, oh, elevation map, map. That's yeah that's right term. yeah yeah topographical isn't the right elevation map elevation right map one. thank you Kanav. that's that's what i was looking for the words you might pick a voltage range that is towards the limits of the voltammogram so i'm just gonna say like zero to like one volt um you might pick like a pretty wide range or you may, you know, something where you're at the edges of the voltammogram. So in reality, you may actually decide to sweep just a little bit more this way and a little bit more this way, just so that you're starting to either oxidize junk or, or, or reduce junk. Um, oxidize, reduce, I said that wrong, but, yeah, yeah. but, um, but but you're starting to clean the surface basically, which should quote activate your catalyst, get your voltammogram into a good a good spot, a good space for you to actually do your catalyst. So I don't know if you have anything to comment on, you know, CV activation. I've always wanted. I've, I've not ever. Um, my understanding of like activation, like what I would do when I was in graduate school, for example, like if, if I had a carbon or like a I don't know like a platinum on carbon or just a platinum electrode, mm -hmm. you know, before I was going you know, to do like an oxygen reduction test or something, the practice is usually to run CV in just some, even a normal range, whether you push out, like you said, you know, where you're really like, you know, reducing or oxidizing, you know, hydrogen evolution or whatever, but you just, you basically just do that over and over again until it's like perfectly tracing on itself. Yeah. And sometimes that's 20 cycles. Sometimes it's a hundred cycles. It depends on, you know, a million factors because electrochemistry is a pain in the butt and something it should look this way but it always doesn't right so it's like anyway i would clean and do cvs like that um and my understanding is that it divests stuff from the surface right it kind of gets the surface in a fresh clean state a repeatable state so that when you then do your reaction of interest whether it's oxygen whatever you're doing yeah. that your surface is like as pristine as it can be so to speak yeah but there's a sometimes i think the activating of like carbon i I guess I'm I'm not perfectly sure if it's like, is it transforming the carbon in any uh, way in the surface? That's a great question. Um, because I'm always leery in general of like, you know, if you're using graphite or, or glassy carbon, you don't want to push the 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 potential too too far, right? Like if you if you're oxidizing, you know, too too high, you'll start producing oxygen that's okay you can do a little bit of oxygen evolution you won't like destroy your electrode right yeah you can do a little bit of hydrogen well literally you can do something you can do hydrogen evolution on the negative end and you're fine but if you push it really far you will start just destroying the carbon right you'll just that oxidize the carbon right so um now you have to go pretty far for that but my point is that pushing up towards that limit can help activate it and i, I guess it's like i'm not a hundred percent sure what it's doing and my 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 knowledge is that maybe you're you're cleaning the surface of of stuff. Maybe you're you know you're in, in, increasing the surface area somehow. Um, but I don't know if there's like a transformative thing. Like I'm not perfectly well versed to know. Like is it is it again is it is it doing some kind of um, 
I don't know, some sort of transformation of the carbon in some way that increases yeah. its activity, <clears throat> right? Like wh what's actually happening there? I'm not hundred percent sure. Oh, graphene oxide to deposit, literally described. Oh, see, Kanav has, oh. has the answer. I did, that was kind of what I was thinking, right? Running CV on graphite causes graphene, graphene oxide. oxide. So when you heavily oxidize yeah. it, obviously not destroying it, but go to a high enough, you know, potential, you get some oxides on. And that, I'm guessing that improves its, um, its, uh, its, its, its electrocatalytic performance, right? So, yeah. so that, that might be, that's one method or, or one answer to that as well. Um, yeah. I think that the point of this too, that I would, I guess, summarize would be that when people want to activate or clean their catalyst, it could be one of a, a number of things, right? It could be a cycling a CV. It could be getting an oxide layer. It could be, could be any number of those things. Perhaps. Yeah. No, no, that's so, true. That's kind of interesting. So it looks like Barry, uh, sorry, it's taking us a while. Barry, <laughs> yeah, yeah. thank you for coming back again. Uh, has a question regarding taffel plots slash slopes and catalysts. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's all good. Put a thing uh, in front of it. As you read it. <laughs> as as read it. It's okay. Uh, regarding taffel plots, slopes and catalysis, what are the parameters like current density over potential line shape in form when catalysis is happening? I'm going to see if I can pull up uh, some data to see if I can kind of answer this. Uh, yeah. I might have, I'm going to just see. So, um, yeah, give us one second. Yeah, so let's see if we can't pull up some, if some data that might be helpful. I might be you. able to, yeah. If, if it's not helpful, I won't share it here, but uh, it's very iffy though. Kanav says doing the experiments for two weeks, you get new results every day. Oh well, yeah. But listen, that's science. This is, this is not just science. This is electric chemistry. If you do five experiments, you're going to get six results. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just the, that's just the truth of electrochemistry. Unfortunately, my friend, I'm very sorry to tell yeah. you be the bearer of bad news here. Yeah. I typically tell people that like, so people say insanity is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result, so but science is doing the same thing over again and getting different results. So yeah. Actually getting, different actually results. getting different results every time. Yeah. That is, that is very, very unfortunate and true. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can. almost up with uh I've got, yeah, I've got some, basically I've got some data from my RRDE webinar. I think I have all the TAFL stuff here. I might just try to plug it in. Let me get the right, um, where are my columns here? This one and that one. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna yeah. try to put some data in front of you and then we can talk this through. Yeah, I was I was so, under the impression- P versus log. Yeah, I think I've only like, looked at TAFL analysis and slopes versus. just from understanding whether a reaction is occurring or not, whether you're getting maybe one electron, two electron based on the slope. Okay. Um, and then you're doing a, a reaction that you ideally hope is catalytic in nature. Okay. Um, but let's see. So forget so about this. some of this. Let's see, where is my share? That's Here's the one. Here's there our software. Mm -hmm. All right. So yep. this comes from my RRDE webinar. So you can see what I actually did was that, okay, this is um, ruthenium hexamine. This was data I collected. I guess you see at various rotation rates. Um, I'm skipping like 150,000 steps here yeah. just to get to the end where you're talking about your TAFL. So I presume you know how to get the TAFL, convert to TAFL data. But for those who are uninitiated, the TAFL data, and, and, and I just created a plot with no units on purpose, I'm just trying to get this quickly, just kind of talk it through. But um, the TAFL data is looking at the, effect. it's basically a rearrangement of the uh, butler volmer equation to obtain kinetic information. And the TAFL slope is giving you some of that information as far as the reversibility of your, um, uh, sorry, the symmetry is the word I'm looking for, of uh, your reaction. And ideally it would be an irreversible process. And then how many electrons are transferred, things like that. Okay. Um, and I got a continuous sort of uh, measurement of that by doing what Kateki Levich analysis to get my kinetic current and basically plotting the potential. Wait, do I have that right? E, e is on the x-axis. And you use kinetic current. I think I have you this use kinetic current. To kinetic, get it's this, kinetic right? current, but I think yeah. I think I plotted this backwards. That's why I'm trying to 
trying to make, I think, uh, uh, I, think I, yeah, I think I have to switch XY. it. I just grabbed this from my Excel sheet and my Excel sheet's all nicely laid out. And I'm like trying to make sure I, that's it. That looks better. That's better. That's the okay. Saw. Yeah. Okay. So like I was saying, this is the, this axis here is, I'm not going to label, I'm not going to waste your time. This is a uh, potential <laughs> <laughs> and this is log of the kinetic current. Okay. So part of the answer to your question, which you said, right. Um, there. You know, what are the parameters like current density over potential line shape to inform when the catalysis is happening? Well, first of all, one of the things you're doing is just directly comparing the y-axis on your TAFL plot with the x-axis on your RRDE data. So when I'm looking at my RRDE data from which I got my TAFL stuff, there's some obvious answer to your question where I'm saying, oh, well, look at this data. My reaction is clearly happening. My oxygen reduction reaction, or no, that's not what this. This is just the uh, ruthenium hexamine reduction. Excuse me, around minus a hundred, minus two hundred millivolts, something in that range, right? Right around here is where the business is happening. That's where my um, catalysis is happening. Okay, so when I'm looking at my TAFL plot, in some ways, I'm going to answer, well, here, right, in this window, one hundred to two hundred. Now you can see some comparison that on my TAFL plot, I've got a relatively straight line and then you can see the slope does start to change around there. So in some ways, an answer to your question is like where the slope starts to kind of change. And this is why TAFL plots are also really bizarre and tricky sometimes because people will frequently have these like, well, I can take the slope baseline Right. And it's like, where do I take the TAFL slope? Well, great question. I don't know. It's up to your interpretation. So let's <laughs> say I want it to be here. This is 60 millivolts per decade. That's like ideal. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, but that's, and, and maybe that works. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's showing I have a good, perfect, uh, reversible, irreversible, you know, uh, one electron transfer or two, like this would be two electron, right? Cause it's, it's, it should be 120. Well, if I want to, try and get my slope in this 100 to 200 window. I try to eyeball it here uh, without getting too formal. Maybe I want to take it there and I start to get, okay, you know, that's where the catalysis is really happening. And so that's where I want to get my slope. Um, people do that. And then, you know, you, people will, you, you might have uh, the sort of, the sort of analysis where you find, okay, this is 120, close to 120 millivolts per decade. Well, that's between... And, and, and this, what I'm doing right now is almost like sometimes people do it this way where it's it's almost like you're backwards determining the answer to the question that you actually asked, which is where's the catalysis happening? Well, if I know, so to speak, that I have this perfect one electron irreversible process happening, that should correspond to a TAFL slope of 120. So if I just arbitrarily sort of make my slope 120, right here, 119, 120. Okay, perfect. Well, then this is minus 150 millivolts and this is minus 220. So then that means that I'm telling, I my TAFL slope is doing, it's doing the opposite. I'm using my TAFL slope to inform me that between about here and here is where the real catalysis is happening. So that's one... <laughs> I, and, and again, yeah, yeah. part of this is 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 not like a set answer for you because you'll read again, just like science, which kind of you'll appreciate as well that uh, you read five papers on TAFL slopes and you'll get six different explanations. It, this is the, the way it works. Unfortunately, it's 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 a it's a it's a fun thing in some sense because you get a lot of like it's open for interpretation. You know, that's part of the research. You're, you're doing your own investigative kind of stuff, but it's also frustrating as heck because well, what's the right answer? Well, nobody really, everyone's got yeah. their own, you know, interpretation. So I hope that's somewhat useful to sort of just show you and talk through a little bit of, you know, looking at the TAFL slope and cor correlating it to your RRDE data, you know, um, I guess yeah. The current, yeah Barry, current. Let us know if you need yeah, further yeah, clarification. Yeah, if, if, if you need more, yeah, please, please let me know. But I think I covered. Yeah, basically over potentials. That so that's the potential yeah. windows there. The shape of your, you know, TAFL slope. Of course, you know, for example, I would avoid a lot of the stuff at the end because that's where you're mostly diffusion controlled over here, and so you're kind of getting out of the realm of um, kinetic current. Right? It's not really kinetic information. If you go too high, you start getting diffusion limited. So, so there you go. 
Um, I hope I hope that is, as I said, reasonable. I'll address yeah. this next one because I use oh, this. So, so oh, yeah, yeah. Now you had asked initially, is there a preset? It needs to do electroplating. Right. Um, using Nova. Nova. So first of all, the, the main follow-up is whether you're using Nova 2 or 1. So I used Metrom Autolab potential stats when I was in graduate school. I'm not endorsing them. <laughs> I, I work for Pine now. Yeah. Uh, that being said, uh, as we've said, and various times during these live streams, uh, we we don't uh, speak poorly of our competitors. I, I used the Auto Lab Potential Stat in graduate school; it was perfectly fine. And um, I don't have the most the best ability to give you firm, um, you know, advice on another company's software. Certainly, it's not right. I I know Pine software. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, if you're using Nova 2.0 or 2. whatever, I don't know what, exactly what they what they're at at this point. Um, but the new Nova is very bizarre to me. I don't. I've seen it, but I don't. Um, it's I, I've not, when I was in graduate school because I'm 150,000 years old. It was <laughs> they did not they had not released Nova 2 yet. So I've only used the older Nova um, software package, which is like one when I was in graduate school it was like one point. 9, 1.12, some, something like that. Anyway, it was more text-based. There were some presets, um, but it was like when they went to Nova 2, it, it, it looks like an iPhone or an Apple app. And yeah. I, again, I'm 150,000 years old. I don't, I, I don't like kids these days and their, new, <laughs> their newfangled technologies. I honest to God, I don't really get it. It, it. it looks to me like you have to build everything from scratch which is fine. It's just that there's Autolab has little things where it's like, yeah, 2.1.5. Yeah. It's like, you have to add like sell on, and then you have to add like set the potential here or sweep for, you have to add every, you know, thing into it. It isn't, um, and maybe there are presets, but I just, I don't recall, I don't know enough of theirs. Like in this amazing software platform that you're looking at <laughs> aftermath, if I want to do a cyclic voltammetry, I just pick cyclic voltammetry and then all the parameters are here. You don't have to tell it to turn the cell on. It's going to just do it. So some of those things are different with Nova and it's not necessarily better or worse. I'm just an old person and it's not for me um, per se, but um, for electroplating, I will say that probably wouldn't you think you'd want to do like a chrono potentiometry or chrono amperometry yeah. experiment, right? So you said you tried yeah. LV, but I assume you mean maybe LSV and CV. So yeah. I, I would generally say probably a sweep technique is not the best for plating yeah because with plating you know you're basically using like faraday's law of electrolysis mm -hmm. right effectively that's that's what you're doing um to to do electroplating and faraday's law of electrolysis i'll just again i'll just sort of pull up whereas just get a little equation um, um, I mean, yeah. yeah, just, I mean, this, right. It's like, um, okay, let's share. Yeah. I'm going to share just, just, uh, just again to illustrate Faraday's laws, uh, this one. Yeah. I got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. The right, right window. Basically you're trying to get a mass, right. And it's related to the charge. Um, Faraday, Faraday's constant. What do we have here? The, the total charge, the avocado, it depends on which version you're using here. Um, but, um, effectively it's, it's a correlation of mass to electrons transferred. And so if you're trying to plate like X grams or moles of copper onto platinum, whatever it is, right. You can, you, you're, you're, you want to, you need to know like how much charge was passed over some period of time. Like that's the yeah. key. And so you're either applying a constant potential, which is important because you know, it's driving the reaction of interest set by mm -hmm. the potential. And then, you know, your current will decay and you're going to integrate your current over time to get charge. Um, or you're applying, I'll read that in a second, or you're applying a, a set current to get a certain amount of charge over time. And yeah, so you say- I tried pulsing and chrono as well, but as soon as I add parameters, the errors are more than I can. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's well, probably a software thing. Yeah. Yeah, so, but, so it sounds like you're really dealing more with a software thing, but I, cr chrono, I think is- Yeah, chrono is chrono is chrono potentiometry or chrono amper. I would, I would suggest doing a chrono and- Probably yeah. apart from that advice, I can't likely help you more, mainly because 
like I said, we're we Nova's not my company's yeah. uh software, so I don't know more about the specifics of like where's the chrono technique and what you have to add to make it really work. I don't know enough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but chrono, um, I've done some like electro plating with our own like screen printed electrodes. Yeah. And usually using like a galvanostatic technique where you hold a constant current so that the rate of your reaction uh, is is constant and it varies the potential. So chrono potentiometry um, tends to be best. So there really should just be two parameters, the current and the time. That's really all it should be. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, again, we don't know Nova uh, or this Nova 2.1.5 um throw a hail mary and see what happens you have to put like like i said it's like um there's like auto lab control this is what it was again in like nova 0.0 back in 1840 it was like (laughs) auto lab control and then sell on you have to have those like preceding the chrono step something like that Hmm. i don't know there's, there's some weird stuff that's not necessarily at least to me it didn't feel intuitive and i don't know if that's different with the new nova maybe it's included but if you say you're getting some errors i don't again it's like you might there's probably some like step you have to throw you could try try some of that yeah but uh anyway i hope that's current and time okay hopefully that hopefully that helps just current and time also you asked if we work on projects nowadays this is our project (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) Um, I mean, yeah, we, we do a lot of different stuff, but yeah, uh, not, not chemistry projects. Yeah, we, we don't do like, we don't do, uh, research, yeah. we don't have access to a lab. Uh-huh. Although with all the stuff that we know now, it's like, man, I kind of wish we had a lab to just play with things. We but... have an actual lab. We could like do some, some fun stuff. Yeah. We don't, we don't get to do fun things anymore. The, yeah. the problem is that when you're in graduate school, you're, you're throwing your head against the wall and it's terrible. And, and, uh, you're, you're trying stuff and failing a lot. And then by the time you get good at it, you leave and you're not doing it anymore. Yeah. Right. That's uh, that's the catch 22 of graduate school and research. Yeah. Unless you become a permanent, I don't know, postdoc or, you know, then you yeah. get to do research when you're good at it and, and, and that kind of thing. It's kind of, kind of the inevitability. It's like, if you're good at something, you end up moving up or, you know, and then you the don't. Peter, the Peter principle, you move up to the point of uh, uh, where, you, where you can't, you can't like, what was it? Com- not complacency. Um, but it's like, if you're, if you're good at sales, you're really good at sales, but then they promote you to being a sales manager, but you're not good at managing people. So yeah, it's like, Oh, you, you don't want to get hired to the point where you're not actually good at the thing that they have yeah. put you up for. But my, our boss has this uh, axiom he mentioned once, because uh, I think it was like his, his daughter was working somewhere and she got promoted and it was like, she liked doing the thing before she got promoted and she mm-hmm. got promoted to some leadership position. And it was like, the axiom is like, if you're smart, you're not allowed to remain where you are. Yeah, You must, <laughs> you must get promoted perpetually if you're smart and competent or, you know, yeah. good at what you do. It's like, you're, you're not allowed to like, if you just want to be like, have some position that's like at a, lo- at a lower level than your credentials or something, whatever, I'm not going to denigrate any position. I'm just saying oh, yeah, like, yeah. like, if you're qualified for something, right. But you just would, be happy working here. Like then in some sense, like what do you, why can't you do that? Right. But you're not allowed. It's, you're just not allowed. You will be promoted and they will pay you more. You're not allowed to, to just do else. a simple task. Exactly. So you have to, you have to lie. You have to be good at something, <laughs> but not too good. Like Kanav says, exactly. Yeah, to, yeah, that's right. You have to be kind of good, but like, be like, Oh, I, I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I guess I'll just stay here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Uh, let's see. So we have another question, um, from our Chinese friend. My anode is doing OER, oxygen evolution reaction. Cathode is, I think, CO2 reduction. Yeah, looks like it. Um, I want to make a procedure to see my catalyst activation. I scared high current will hurt my catalyst. High current might hurt your catalyst. Uh, depends how high. Uh, and it all depends, uh, we would need to know a little bit more about like perhaps specific concentrations, but doing catalysis by definitions, sort of say will lead to high currents, right? Um, because for example, if you have a, you know, your catalyst is working on a substrate, there's usually a lot of substrate that you want to catalyze to whatever thing it may be. And then 
that process, usually if it's a good catalyst, might be very fast, right? So if it's very able to quickly uh, oxidize or reduce, do its catalysis, it'll generate a lot of current, much more current than you might think your catalyst should be doing. Um, but if you're scared of really, really high currents, then you could just do a small, uh, or if he's talking about activation, actually, no, he's talking about catalyst activation. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, don't, you don't need to go the super high currents, uh, just like adjust the voltage, look at the points when it starts to oxidize and starts to reduce on the edges and then tailor that to your potential. I, I think I misunderstood your question initially. You're talking about CV, cyclic voltammetry activation. So, oh yeah, I think this is related to the yeah the related the to the person who asked the CV activation yeah, yeah I yeah. think so okay so that's yeah. a follow up to that probably yeah so just don't go just don't go super super high like you're getting like normal normal current and then you're starting to get like oxidation and reduction on these other sides or however whichever side once you see a little bit of it starting to go just make sure just limit your CV to that range but you may need to do a little bit of trial and error because you might be able to push it a little bit further and it cleans or activates your catalyst more um, you know, substantially. But again, another thing to watch out for is that your reference electrode potential might shift. So if it shifts and it's like you're at the edge where you're getting this kind of exponential increase or decrease in current, a, a, you know, a few millivolts shift could actually uh, mean a lot or, 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 or damage your catalyst, as you said. So you can keep it relatively narrow before it goes super high and then just have it have it sweep back and forth more times. Like instead of 50 cycles, have it do 100 cycles, something like that. So that is my recommendation for a procedure for, uh, for catalyst activation where you're not getting super high currents. So I hope that, hope that was helpful. Uh, let's see. Do we have there any? Was, there was a question from Barry. Uh, sorry, there's one. Oh, there's none more. There's one that says about oh. physics by NT. Uh, I can't exactly tell us, but some talking about publications on supercapacitors, including things like cyclic voltammetry, impedance, uh, GCD, which is galvanostatic charge discharge characterizing in one video. So I don't know so much if you're going to have uh, much luck finding videos. Uh, with all of that, or, you know, I'm sure there are probably some videos on, um, you know, supercapacitors and, and, and things like that. But, you know, mostly you're probably looking at things like li literature. I mean, I, I literally just tried to take a quick look at like Google Scholar here. And so, you know, I, I just searched for galvanic static charge, just start super like just <laughs> basically what you mentioned. And, you know, <laughs> some of the first few um, papers you'll see here. So here's a, you know, quick shout out to this, these groups it appears in India and Saudi Arabia here, but mm -hmm. this is, you know, some group uh, from a few years ago studying uh, one of our copper molybdenum right. catalyst. And you can see that they did exactly what you're talking about, which is there's some physical characterization as usual. And then you have electrochemistry, you have some cyclical telemetry. Here's galvanostatic charge discharge. Here's some impedance. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, um, capacitance cycling basically over time uh you know th this kind of uh this kind of stuff exists for sure uh, ubiquitously in the um in the literature for sure so um I, you know I, I i i don't know if there is a video to be honest like showing all of this um you know the best that you'll probably get for like either video or uh they're using ginger this looks delicious <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a cooking paper or a chemistry paper, <laughs> but I'm suddenly very interested. Um, but uh, so, no, but I mean, the point is that th this kind of data exists, you know, very much so in the literature everywhere. And, you know, you might be able to, here's the galvanic st uh, static charge discharge. Sorry, I'm cutting myself off. But, um, uh, you know, conferences, uh, these days, of course, there's a lot of conferences that are, you um, uh, what a remote and electronic and hybrid and stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you'd be able to find like presentations where someone, you know, is presenting on their supercapacitor in some symposium. You might be able to find like that as a video because, you know, it's probably not a lot of like YouTube, maybe there is, and I could be wrong. I haven't 
to be honest, done a lot of extensive searching or looking at videos, but uh, I, I would, I would doubt that there's a lot of like YouTube content of like, here's my super capacitor and here's exactly how to do all of these processes, right? That might be a little hard to find in that specific kind of a scientific, you know, very um, specific scientific context, if you will. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it for sure doesn't exist, but um, your best bet is probably to look at some of the literature. Um, and then, like I said, possibly conference materials, you might find some, some presentations in that regard that, uh, that, you know, give some of those, so those information or talk through some of those processes for you, I guess. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Barry, thanks for joining as a tier one member. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. And let's I see. I think uh, Barry has a follow-up question. I think we've gotten through most I of I think we got most of it. Now I've had some yeah. questions and maybe has left at this point, but uh, let's see. Barry. Okay, Adash, you said you didn't describe the situation well. Please feel we're going to answer Barry's question from above. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, please feel free to type in and clarify if um, if if you need to provide yeah. some more context because I yeah I, I copied your questions from the previous like yeah. YouTube event before I switched to this one. Um, and I, we, we just read them as they were. So if you did have some other specific kind of question, um, related to your, uh, what you asked previously, please uh, type them now. Yeah, I see you will. So one, yeah, let's see what yeah, Barry yeah, we can said. So Barry asked, do TAFL measurements need to be performed via RRDE? Also, why does DPV look different when scanning uh, negative to positive and positive to negative. Ecamm class in graduate school was not effective use of time learning as I go. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. You just kind of have to. I'm just learn. impressed you had an Ecamm class at all. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I don't know that most universities have an actual electrochemistry class. I'm, which, my... is, which is a problem because yeah, electrochemistry like, is important. <laughs> and it's really hard. That's very hard. Um, and uh, yeah, I had one, but that's because my advisor when I was in graduate school was like the electrochemist. And so he took it upon himself to teach a class and it was, you know, it was excellent. Um, and so it was helpful for me, but he also like, because he was really, he was awesome. I had an amazing advisor. He, he like taught me personally when I joined the group, like here's a crash course in electrochemistry. Here's all the basics and all this kind of stuff. And then I learned it again in a class as two. Uh, but anyway, I'm just saying it's, um, I'm impressed that you, have a had a class at all because I, I do find it to be rare that universities yeah. have dedicated electrochemistry courses mostly it's like it's just you know there's some yeah. research and people are just thrown into the lab and like good luck you know it's hard yeah um, yeah so so i don't think so to answer your first question no. i don't think you have to have a rotating disc to do a TAFL measurement some people can do it on stationary electrodes at very, very slow scan rates. I think it depends on the situation. Like what is the electrochemical system that you're studying? So I think that the, the answer is no. Um, and in fact, R, you don't need, as Alex even said, you don't even need RDE, let alone yeah. RRDE because the ring as part of the RRDE is not part of the TAFL slope. That yeah. the, Actually the only purpose of, well, there's several purposes of the ring. RRDE, but in, 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 in many contexts and in the one that I showed before, you know, earlier with their software, I mainly used the ring just as a means of displaying collection efficiency. Um, you know, in, in oxygen reduction reaction, it's a means to collect peroxide to see how um, efficient your catalyst is there. It's, it's, it, it serves a lot of different purposes, but not actually needed necessarily for the TAFL analysis. Um, and as Alex said, you don't have to rotate. The key for the TAFL measurement really is that it's kinetic current, right? It's kinetic information. Yeah. So it just so happens that rotating your electrode is a very nice way to get kinetic information, yeah. right? You're By rotating, you're heavily controlling the th thickness of the diffusion layer, which allows you to essentially separate diffusion and kinetic processes more easily. Right with things like a Levitch or Kateki Levitch analysis, and mm -hmm. so it allows you to obtain diffusion limited current and kinetic current information. But you know, people make TAFL slopes all the time from just voltammetry yeah. data or whatever, and they're either using systems where I suppose 
they're in a region that's mostly kinetic control, right? Or yeah. something like that. And so they're just effectively saying, well, this is kinetic current, this is kinetic information, and I have no diffusional or minimal yeah. diffusional what would you say, like interference? Or- yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, or they do and they're ignoring that and just doing it anyway. But strictly speaking, no, you don't need to do RRDE for TAFL measurements. And then I don't know if you want to talk about the DP. Yeah, um, so so yes. Um, so the DPV should look different, but you can think about scanning positive to negative and negative to positive in the same way that you think about going negative to positive and positive to negative for a cyclic voltammogram. So, um, so like, for example, oh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just, just kind of, kind of drive, um, the, I'll just share screen this and then annotate. So like in a cyclic voltammogram, we can think about, so more importantly, be, beyond that, let's just say if we have a voltage current, so if you have a redox process and let's just make something very simple, A plus an electron equilibrium reversible with B. And let's say that the E naught was equal to, well, don't want to use that I want capital E. Let's say that E naught was equal to, let's just say 500 millivolts. It's an oxidation process. And we will say that uh, 500 millivolts is here. So 500 MV. So what I want to point out is that if I start my, my, my DPV scan here, I've got a ton of B in my solution. Like it's already there. Like there's tons of it. Like if I just step the potential starting at minus one volt, I got lots of B in the solution. Wait, minus one or plus one? Sorry, plus one. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Plus one volt. Um, contrary, if I started at, say, zero volts, I've got much more A in my solution. So when I start scanning, this is going to be very different. Like my current is going to be just like very different. Um, because if I just start, like, Oh, okay. Here's another way to think about it. If I took a cyclic voltammogram, it would look like uh, it would look something like this. I'm trying to get something, something like this. I'm trying to be very, very slow. Something like that, right? So if I did a cyclic voltammogram starting from here, going this direction, that's what it would look like. All right. So keep that in mind. Now I'm going to clear this. Clear all my drawings. Now let's say I did that same thing. But I started my cyclic voltammogram here. What would it look like? Well, if uh, oxidation current's negative, it would look like this. And then, actually, now this would get uh, this would get reduced. Wait, are you doing Do, Texas oh, I'm convention doing, or UPAC convention? Sorry, I'm getting Texas and UPAC convention uh, mistaken. Sorry about that. I'm getting, I'm getting my conventions. Texas convention is wrong, by the Texas way. Texas convention. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's what I, I know you do. Quote, you, you do I quote more. grew up with. Sort I think of that's say. why I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. So your voltammogram would start like this if I started from here. Yeah. If I started from here, this is what my voltammogram looked like. It would go like this and I go like this and then. So like, that's what my voltammogram would look like if I scanned from this direction going that way, as opposed to this, this point going that way. So it's not surprising, Barry, that when you do DPV, when you start from negative to positive or positive to negative, your DPV data is going to look different just because of what are the concentrations of the species in your solution at a given time, at any given time or any given point. So hopefully that is helpful. And if you have more questions or need clarification on it, please uh, let me know. We can, we can elaborate more on that. Uh, I would also say that it yeah. might have something to do with the parameters that you're using because two things. First of all, as Alex was showing here, A you know, goes to B. It's kind of like if you have um, ferry ferrocyanide, right? Okay, yeah. one electron. If you start with the ferry cyanide 
and I always forget which one's the reduced form, which one's the oxidized form, whatever. Let's. Oh yeah. Fairy. So if I think fairy gets reduced to ferro, I think that's right. Um, is that right, or is it I do it backwards? I think I think ferrous. Ferro. Fairy. All right. Let's just say I'm just gonna say fairy. I know it's reduced. I know ferrocene and ferrocinium. Ferrocinium yeah. is the oxidized form right. of ferrocene. Well, the point is, but. if you start with the oxidized form and you're at a positive potential, nothing's going to happen. If you start with the oxidized form and you start at a negative potential, you're immediately starting to reduce it. So this is where that kind of weird steep slope where you start that Alex drew it's one of the reasons why it happens. It kind of depends on what's primarily in your solution. Yeah. You usually, now sometimes people start with a 50-50 mixture. That's all kind of a different situation. But if you start with, or you just happen to have all of like one of the, you know, oxidized or reduced side as this thing you're adding to your electrolyte, then that will determine in many ways where you want to start. If you're starting with the reduced form, you might want to start at a negative potential because nothing's going to happen. You can't reduce it more. It's already reduced. And so that way you can start at the reduced form, scan positively, and you start to oxidize it, scan back, whatever. But if you have all reduced form and you just immediately turn on your potential stat, start your CV at a positive potential, you're just immediately starting to oxidize it like yeah. instantly before you even sweep. And it's like, you might not want to do that. So that might be part of the reason. But then the other thing I'd say is that when you, you know, I'm not sure what you mean by the DPV looks different. Like if the peaks are showing up at different locations or it just looks different based on yeah. some of what Alex talked about, which we've just described, but if it's looking different, like the peaks aren't showing up at the right place, that might be a parameter thing because it, yeah. in theory that it sh the peaks should probably end up at the same place, whether you scan positive to negative or negative to positive. And that's because in both cases, by the time you're starting to hit that peak, the kinetic information, that, well, the diffusional stuff, the DPV should be subtracting the baseline either right. direction, no matter what it happens to be. So what that might mean is that you're just, some of your parameters might not be well-tuned. You might be, you know, it's like you might not have long enough at the baseline, or you might have too big a step or too small a step. This is where pulse techniques, they're superior, in my opinion, to standard voltammetry, even though everyone does standard voltammetry more, uh, it just is easier to do. You pick where you want to sweep from and to, and you just go. Pulse techniques allow you to clarify peaks and get rid of background stuff, but there's just more to work out. You have to really like guess, well, what should my increment be? How many steps should it be? How fast do I have to do it? There's a lot more like trial and error. And that's mm -hmm. harder. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a little less ideal. Um, comparatively, right? So for that reason, you might have to just iterate a little bit and figure it out. Um, okay, so I think- uh, so hopefully that was, that was helpful. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully that Ask helped. us yeah. if you have any more clarification. And uh, let's see, Adash has, okay. So thank you for the answers, although he didn't describe the situation. Right. Well, he uses ferrocene as an internal reference and ran CV at least 10 times. The peaks remained exactly the same. Would it mean reference electrode potential remains the same if no changes to electrolytes are being introduced? So if ferrocene is a, quote, internal reference, um, then that means you just have, usually people have, say, like a bare silver wire, and they're doing CV multiple times, and they're noticing like, okay, this ferrocene is on one side, and my chemistry of interest is on the other side. So... The your reference electrode, if if that's the case, and you're using platinum wire, then that means the platinum wire is has not changed. Um, yeah, and and you're 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 pretty good. That's that's a good thing. If if, uh, if there you might have be it. some, you know, it, it you might what what might be happening if I had to guess is that you've like inadvertently created some kind of a couple. Like yeah. this happens with silver, I think, and right. non aqueous is you actually get like a silver, silver oxide and that um, will sort of behave itself as a couple. I think you might have like a platinum oxide that forms. Yeah. Ma you know, like maybe the, there's a platinum, platinum, I don't know or, like perfectly well. Well, well, it, it could be the ferrocene couple, you know, oh, well, the ferrocene couple would, would 
you know, that would be the Nernstein reaction sort of say, yeah, and it sure, happens really that, fast on platform. And that's like settling the reference into place or whatever. Yeah. yeah something like that. The, uh, yeah. That make that could be it too. Tension. So hopefully I, that kind of addresses the situation. Uh, Adash, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Now, if, if you're able to run it multiple times and you're getting a good normal CV, great. You know, <laughs> you're doing, doing fantastic. It's, yeah. it's working. And you're referencing your data with respect to the ferrocene ferrocinium couple, which is published in the literature. Yeah. So it's, you can it's perfectly good. You can compare, you know, versus FC, FC plus. It's like, yeah, there's a million papers that have that they as the that. standard. I mean, that's a very easy thing to reference to and against, right? So that's yeah. that's a very convenient um, kind of thing for you to be using as your as your as your reference yeah. um, for your data afterwards. Especially if it's not going anywhere, you know, if you're scanning yeah, back yeah. and forth and it's really not going anywhere, that's, that's really convenient. Yeah, keep keep an eye on the time too. So like if if you do it like one, like it's not just oh did I do ten CVs in a row? Right. Like space it out in time and see. Yeah, if you're scanning <laughs> at like five hundred millivolts per second, that's only like twelve seconds. You know, yeah, it's right. like that might be feel good, but if you're doing like ten millivolts per second over two volts, and it's actually like you know, 24 minutes of real time and it's yeah. still steady. That's really good news. Yeah. Or just a voltammogram, you know, one or two hours later, it's in the same place. Right. That's, that's the best. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Adash has another question. I may have another question. Which method is best to measure IR drop? Oh, well, so there's a lot of, a lot of methods. Yeah, there's, there are, well, our software, for example, has, has three primary methods. Um, current interrupt, positive feedback, and impedance. In my opinion, the best is impedance. It's probably the most widely used. Um, and it's the least invasive. So um, I are, see, why don't I, you know what? <laughs> just, I, yeah, I, just I almost got, I almost <laughs> got there. And then I realized, like, oh, I look at that. There's a text box. Did you know this feature of text box? Yeah. I are drop determination that was quicker see there we go that's what i was looking for all right so um you have eis see now i'm writing again with a thing. <laughs> yeah wait, a, didn't we just <laughs> listen okay i'm gonna do what i want yeah, okay go for in it. a really stupid way current <laughs> in that's an e <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, this is going very well this is good interrupt <laughs> positive I'm just now. This is now. I can't even positive <laughs> feedback. <laughs> Good grief! I'm so. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, you know, he was gonna ask if impedance is the best. Yeah, I'll briefly talk about each, but then I do think that impedance is the best. Um, impedance, basically, what you're doing if you do an impedance experiment, and let's just say you get like this is your impedance experiment. Basically, all you need is this data right here, right? Wherever that sort of high frequency intercept is this Z real basically, but really it's, it's the, it's, it's really the Z magnitude because your Z I is basically zero. That is effectively your uncompensated resistance, your, your IR drop. It's just super easy to do because you can set your experiment to do like one decade of like, you know, hundred kilohertz. Yeah. 100 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. I don't know. Yeah. Something like yeah. that, you know, 100 maybe to 10, kilohertz quick kind of pulse get your value it's non-invasive because it's just a quick impedance experiment very easy current interrupt is more complicated effectively you're applying some potential and then you immediately disconnect the counter electrode the current is going to then decay but what you have is there's this gap that forms right here Okay. And this gap is equivalent to the IR drop. So I'm not getting into this too much more heavily because I don't, <laughs> I don't personally like it. I think it's, it's very, um, it's not as accurate. And part of the reason is because it's heavily dependent on the time scale and how fast your instrument and your software can acquire, acquire measurement. And it's not ideal to have an experiment be determined by those kinds of um, limitations, right? It's like, well, if my, if my potential stat can only get a point every millisecond or every hundred of a millisecond, right? It's like, but EIS is very fast. Cause, cause yeah. if you're doing a hundred kilohertz or something like faster, that, 10 right. kilohertz, 
it also has to measure quickly but, That's, but, but yeah. i understand i understand your point yeah no you're right it's, it's <laughs> making me look stupid but no uh, yeah the, the this is also more like well you can under you can the covers get it wrong too it like can with, with current interrupt if you just pick the the fastest uh data acquisition rate you could actually pick up stray cable capacitance and stuff yeah. that 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 actually affects the the measured value for your current interrupt. Yeah. So, so, so don't do current interrupt. If but you can. This is what people used to use, and that's why there, it does sometimes persist. That's my opinion, why it persists. Yeah. The way people used to find the IR drop is they would literally have a potential stat, and there was no other way to do this. And so you would you would quite literally tell it to apply you know, a 200 millivolts, and then you would just take the counter electrode and just disconnect it fast. And the current drops to zero, you know, soon or, yeah, quick, you know, because yeah. you disconnected the circuit. And so it decays pretty quickly to zero, but there's a brief drop in the current, like I drew yeah. here. Um, and so you would try to, as quickly as you can, get a measurement of right when you disconnected it, how much did it drop like that before it decayed, before it started to decay. And that current is correlates with um, the yeah. with the, um, that potential, the, the difference in the potential correlated with the difference in current is use Ohm's law. You, you get a, a measure of the yeah. impedance. The but, thing that's also annoying with current interrupt is the selection of like, well, what potential are you applying? Right. Oh, it's yeah. like, uh, you know, you don't want it to be around the Faradaic, uh, but, you know, a, a potential where Faradaic processes are, are occurring because that can, that can affect the, the measurement. Yeah. It, it's a little, and then you do it with two different weird. potentials and it should be like scaling and it doesn't exactly, it doesn't, it doesn't scale. It's exactly. a bit, uh, it's a bit of a mess. It can, yeah. be, it can be tricky. It's tricky. Uh, positive feedback is my favorite one yeah. to do. If you don't have an impedance capable potential stat, you do have to have a potential stat that is capable of doing uncompensated resistance experiments, but basically what you're doing is doing step uh, experiments. You apply zero volts and then some amount of volts and then zero volts again. And you do this over and over again, okay? And the thing that you're varying is how much resistance the potential stat is, uh, is compensating for. So you tell it to compensate, let's just say like 10 ohms and you do step, step, step. And each of these is like one second, one second. So it's pretty fast. Okay. And so eventually you, you, you go up like 10, 20, 30, 40 ohms, whatever. And so eventually you hit something. Okay. Let's say I'm hitting 40 ohms and what you end up seeing is oscillation. So you're at zero. And then as soon as you step up, you get that. That's a pretty good decay. So that's very good. I have good. to say, that's, that's the best. Draw, that's the best art I've ever done. That is great. That I'm, is. I'm that saving is a fantastic this. Fantastic dampening. That's right. <laughs> a plus. That's a 100 percent grade for me. Yeah. <laughs> but you get this oscillation. So anyway, the point yeah. is that once you start, when you when you start compensating around that critical, you know, R zero, the potential stat will start to oscillate, and so basically you just step through different um, resistances until it starts to oscillate. And then you can hone in on what it is. Now yeah. it's, it's less accurate, like precise, I guess. Cause like with impedance, you're going to get like 37.6 ohms or whatever, you know, whatever it is mm -hmm. here, you do 30 and it looks like that you do 40 and it looks like that. And so you say like, well, it's 40. Well, then you could do like 35, 36, yeah, you know, so it, it is a little bit trickier, but it's it's like a pretty quick experiment, and if you can't do impedance, this is a good way to test yeah. for that. It also tells you because mostly the point of IR compensation or, or understanding what the IR drop is is to do IR compensation, and positive feedback tells you exactly at what uh, you know yeah. what happens if I apply this value, right? Um, it's going to go into oscillation. So it tells you the value you need to yeah. apply. It's, it's more it's direct. Different. What my potential stat is going to do if I apply this much yeah. this, this compensation. compensation. And that's another part of this, which is the last thing I'll say about it basically is that you never can really apply a hundred percent because you will send the potential stat into oscillation. Yeah. So you really typically apply like 85 or 90%. Yeah. So the positive feedback is also a good way to hone in on what value should I 
compensate for to make sure I don't destroy, you know, uh, uh, oscillate everything really badly, but I can still get good data taking out that, you know, resistance. Yeah. Or so. There's actually a paper published uh, recently. Uh, Jillian Dempsey sent it to me. This guy has a full detailed article on IR uh ir compensation actually if you do uh, just a google search on it it's, I I it's find it. yeah it's like analytical i think it was published in analytical chemistry or something uh john is the last name of the there's so just ir compensation and then oh uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be dempsey didn't publish it oh it, oh was it john i think it's john but um if you hit enter You'll actually find it in just regular Google, Google search. Uh, let me try. So it. let's just try a regular Google search. Just IR compensation, just that search. Oh, just should. Understand. Let's see. Oh, it I should be like in papers on it. With the let's see, keep going down. Oh wait, wait, no. Actually, go right, go back up. There we go. IR compensation for electric catalysis studies. Oh, this one right here. That one, yeah. Wow, it's already one of the high. Yeah. So that was yeah, Warren Jung, and it was I think it was published recently. It's it's a very good. We can maybe we can just link yeah, it put in the, the uh, in in the chat. Um, copy. So this is it's a pretty good IR compensation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty it's pretty good. Um, and he talks about it's like <laughs> IR comp can get very uh. It can get complicated, especially for electrocatalysis studies, because even adjustments, like adjustments in the amount of compensation can actually change your current values relatively considerably. So yeah, uh, which it, it's com it's gosh, it'd be nice if that didn't happen because it's like yeah. you're you know, you're just trying to compensate and get the most accurate data, but it's like, well, you're making it less accurate. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. So it's different. Yeah. See, no compensation on the fly after the scan. Oh yeah. Why and, they're all so different. That's not fun. Yeah. And and if you look at just the difference between like a 90% compensation and the 85% compensation and a 95% compensation, they're decent, they're decent changes, especially if if the current in catalysis is very high. Uh oh, okay. Adash read this one. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I think it came out very recently. Yeah, so. 2023. It's 2023. So yeah, it's a very it's a it's quite a good paper. Um, I learned a few little things about it, but uh, it's interesting. But you know, we come from a company that like makes these things, so we know exactly what what the potential set is doing during IR compensation, and yeah. uh, it's it's very interesting. So yeah, uh, part of the part of the joy is combining what we know is happening, or what we know the software is supposed to do, or whatever, with the reality of doing research. Yes, right, and it's like connecting those two right because we come from graduate yeah, yeah. research and now we're like working for the company making the thing and it's like trying to bridge the gap sometimes it's interesting but to say the least you know yeah but uh yeah so yeah anyway well i think that's, that i, I think guess that does it. it yeah i think that does it we don't have any other questions yeah. um i think you'll be out next week right i'm i am out next week if i will run the live stream it's possible what is it i'm, I'm at a I'm at a conference, so I'll be in. I will be in Boston. Yeah, for Northeastern Northeastern University. It's the regional ACS meeting. Uh, it's called NERM N E R M, for what it's worth. If anybody's <laughs> going to be there, uh, and uh, a sm smaller regional meeting. If anybody's in Northeastern University next week, I'm be happy to see you there. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll see Alex next week, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll run. The, I won't be able to run it quite as well because he knows all the. Oh well, that's just stuff. Not really uh my plan was not suitable and low for, I, I watched a video about shunt for oh, reference electrode why oh so probably the reason for your question adarsh is if you're comparing it to what you did what you're talking about you had ferrocene oh, for eis um your the platinum in the low frequency region didn't work well for the shunt because it was an aqueous system no, no, you don't have to be, you don't have to apologize yeah. for sure. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, this is why we have this slow roll yeah. ending because of there's a delay and like, well, we're like, well, we're going to call it a break now, but someone might be typing and there's a delay. So, um, so I, I am happy to, to slow down the ending if there are yeah. questions. That's yeah. why we do this, That's right? Why we do this. We're doing this for questions. We're, we're happy. And I see there's, a, you missed, uh, 
you just saw this for the first time. We, we've been doing these uh, OPA here at uh, um, OPA if, 1111 AM. Yeah, if that's the, if I read that correctly. Um, we, three ones. Yes, three ones. Okay. Three ones. <laughs> one, one, one. Um, you, yeah, we, this we is a new event so. we've been doing um, on Fridays at this time, 1 p.m. Eastern uh, US time. Uh, and uh, this is like the 10th one that we've done, I think. So uh, yes, we're we're trying to do these um, live streams to just uh, you know answer yeah. electric chemistry questions, sort of like an office hours if you were in graduate school, something like that. Um, so yeah, if yeah. you have a question, you can type it in now, quickly ish. Um, we'll yeah. try to answer it before we before we uh, leave. And otherwise, you, you can you can come in the future. You can look at this, you know, yeah. recording later. Put a put a comment on it like you would any YouTube video too. Yeah. So those you know any of those options work great. Tell your friends in graduate school and your friends in other graduate schools and spread the word, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but Adarsh, to, to, again, to, to finish that yeah. thought on your question, the platinum in what I showed for my shunt video wasn't really great at low frequencies because it was an aqueous system. It's not the same as what you were doing where we talked about probably that ferrocene, ferrocinium couple was locking the platinum in place for the non-aqueous. I was showing an aqueous system, the platinum probably didn't have something quite as convenient to lock it in place. And it really is pseudo reference. It's drifting around. It's not, um, it's not an ideal um, kind of reference to use for aqueous electrochemistry. Um, so th that's probably the main difference for why, you know, works in one case doesn't work in the other case. Cause if it, if it did work in this um, aqueous situation that I showed, then I wouldn't have even needed the shunt. I wouldn't yeah. have even needed the reference electrode at all, right? I just used the platinum wire, but um, pseudo references. My hunch is to say this, I, I suppose it may not be true in all situations, but my hunch is to say that pseudo references work much better in non-aqueous than in aqueous. And probably because of the ferrous, you can have like a, an internal standard, you know, you don't use internal standards for aqueous systems really. So um yeah, I don't, you know, I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of. I mean, I don't. It, it it's 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 more common for non aqueous. So, yeah. um, you know that the whole not uh, the whole phenomenon of 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 pseudo reference, mm -hmm. you know, is really more applicable. And, I mean, part of it too is that frankly, you have the ability to use these really nice, well behaved, non polarizable, you know, redox aqueous, you know, systems like calomel and silver chloride and mercury mm -hmm. sulfate in an aqueous system. So it makes sense to do so when you can. Yeah. Um, so, so hopefully that answers, you know, that question about at least the differences for what you're seeing with your platinum as a reference in what I showed in that um, shunt video and why you, you know, want to use a shunt. Yeah. So I guess mm -hmm. we'll try a second time to say yeah. we're done. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, OPA or Adarsh, if you have any other questions, yeah, you've got about know. one minute of real time to type it in, or we will yeah. call it a weekend, a day here, and you know, um, yeah, and we'll, join us another week or type a comment in the the, the video later, yeah. and, and we'll launch this. Uh, we'll do the same thing. Yeah, same thing next time, next week. Same. What is it? Same bat time. Same, same bat place. place. Yeah. Well, well maybe different bat place. Different but, bat. But yeah. it'll be different bat for you. It'll be different bat place. I won't be home. Yeah. 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 Uh, ET change its potential if you make any changes to the solution. Probably. Yeah. 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 It's going to be like just based on the Nernst equation. Right. Yeah. And it's going to be dependent on the concentration of your stuff in your species. solution. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, which is cool. So, it's electric chemistry. It's, yeah. When I was talking to Dan Shears, but Dan Shearson was the person who like taught me about it. And, uh, it was, it was mind blowing. It was interesting to think about like just the platinum wire and solution and your, yeah, your, your redox potential space there. But anyway, anyway, we're done. See y'all later. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Anyway, take care, everybody. Yeah. Thank All you right. very much.